Unless you have been cryogenically frozen or trapped in some kind of underground bunker, cut off from the outside world for the last two to three weeks, you are likely to be aware of the rapid takeover of Afghanistan by the Taliban following the withdrawal of US and allied troops, culminating in the fall of Kabul on August 15th, which came shortly after the Afghan president, Ashraf Ghani, had fled the country. The Taliban previously held much of Afghanistan, though not as much territory as they do now, from 1996 to 2001, when they declared the Islamic Emirati of Afghanistan, a state which was viewed as being illegitimate by most of the world and was only recognised by Pakistan, Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. During Afghanistan's previous five years of Taliban rule, the country operated as a theocracy, implementing a strict interpretation of Islamic or Sharia law. The Taliban provided a safe haven for notorious global jihadists, women were brutally oppressed, and public executions were an everyday occurrence. The militant Islamist group claims to have become more moderate since then, and they may have to be, in order to maintain popular support but few would be so naive as to take them at their word. The chaotic scenes that those of us watching from afar have witnessed then, from the sudden change in dress to thousands scrambling to escape the country via Kabul airport, is deeply understandable. Despite the Taliban's claims that they will not seek reprisals against those who aided US and allied troops over the last 20 years, nor those who have participated in acts that would now contravene the Taliban's interpretation of Sharia, there is already plenty of evidence to suggest that they are telling one story to the international community whilst doing the complete opposite at home, with brutal torture and executions already having been reported. In light of everything that I've just said, football and sport in general might seem rather insignificant in relation to the life-threatening reality facing thousands of Afghans and the grand scheme of what is going on in Afghanistan right now. And in many ways it is but football and other sports play a huge part in people's lives, and Afghans are no exception. Throughout more than four decades of virtually uninterrupted war, chaos, and destruction, whether that be with the Soviets, internal conflicts, or the war between the Northern Alliance and their allies fighting against Islamists since the invasion of Afghanistan in 2001, sport, and particularly cricket and football, have often provided rare moments of joy and unity among the Afghan people, giving an all-too-brief indication that something better, a better life, was actually possible for the Afghan people, who are all too often treated as an afterthought, if not totally airbrushed from reality, by many Western media outlets. In 2013, Afghanistan's men's national football team won the South Asian Championship, or the SAF, for the first time, defeating India 2-0 in the final. Afghans poured out onto the streets, Processions of cars with people waving Afghan flags out the windows or sat atop them drove through the streets of Kabul, chanting and honking their horns. Thousands piled into Afghanistan's national football stadium, even though the tournament and the final took place in Nepal, wanting to express their joy and support for the team as a collective experience, and notably with many women present. These images represent the power of football, in terms of its ability to bring different people and communities together in a common goal unlike almost anything else. Aside from the communal experience and the ecstasy and agony of collectively witnessing national team triumphs and failures, football and sport more broadly is an immensely important hobby and passion in many Afghans' lives, providing a form of exercise, entertainment, and, perhaps most importantly of all, escapism. Sport also plays a key role in people's sense of national identity and of belonging. So whilst Afghanistan clearly has bigger fish to fry than football right now, and I would not be so tone deaf and insensitive as to suggest otherwise, nor do I think the importance of sports can be totally disregarded or ignored. And since it is an issue which has received very little coverage, at least as far as I can tell, Today I wanted to try and shed some light on what the Taliban's takeover could mean for football in Afghanistan, and perhaps beyond. When the United States invaded Afghanistan in late 2001, with the support of a number of allies, most notably the United Kingdom, they did so with the publicly stated intention of dismantling Al-Qaeda, the terrorist group behind the September 11th attacks on the United States, and of removing the Taliban from government. Though it would take a decade before US Navy SEALs found and killed Osama bin Laden in Pakistan, the leader of Al-Qaeda, 
US and UK troops, and later, other international militaries, along with the Northern Alliance, were fairly effective in implementing those initial goals. The threat of Al-Qaeda was severely weakened, and it took just two months for the Taliban to be removed from power. However, plans to turn Afghanistan into a liberal democracy, as the US and their other allies intended, would prove to be rather more challenging. Operation Enduring Freedom, as the US government named it, was an exercise in nation-building, despite President Biden's recent claims to the contrary. Sporting development was to play a key role in these plans. Sports in Afghanistan had been severely hindered by the rule of the Taliban during the 1990s, with all women's sport banned and men's sport heavily restricted and, in some cases, virtually outlawed due to the level of restrictions. The new Afghan government and those who supported it viewed sport as being symbolic of progress and of liberation in Afghanistan, particularly in relation to women's rights. Not only were all women's sports banned in Afghanistan by the Taliban from 1996 to 2001, sports stadiums were even used as the venues for the public state executions of women who broke those laws, often as half-time entertainment during men's football matches. So the participation of Afghan women in sports like football and cricket was about much more than those sports themselves. It was deeply symbolic. Every kick, catch, corner, bowl or goal carried a sense of empowerment and represented the fact that change was afoot. Initially, it had been difficult to convince Afghan women that they could live normal lives. Under Taliban rule, women had to wear full face coverings and couldn't leave the house unless they were accompanied by a male relative, and punishment for failing to follow those laws were severe. As such, just getting women out of their homes was a real task, and sport was used as a way of giving Afghan women confidence. It brought women out of their homes and into wider society, emboldening them so that they felt able to live normal lives. For this reason, sports stars have been among the most high-profile critics of the Taliban and supporters of progressive movements in Afghanistan over the last 20, and particularly the last 10 years. That symbolism, association, activism, and opposition has led to very legitimate fears that athletes and sporting institutions could now face reprisals from the Taliban following their return to government. The Afghan women's team had a mission statement that went far beyond football, aiming to represent a new Afghanistan, where women and girls could do things that previous generations couldn't. As Khalida Popal puts it, an Afghan women's rights activist, and the program director of the Afghanistan women's national team, they quote, wanted to represent the generation of dreamers and hope. Popal fled Afghanistan in 2011, firstly to India, then Norway, and finally to Denmark, where she was granted refuge due to the threat to her life in Afghanistan, and where she had continued campaigning and working with the women's team whilst living in Denmark, up until the Taliban's recent power seizure. A clearly distraught Popal has recently given interviews describing the pain of telling women and girls who she has spent more than a decade inspiring and empowering through sport to burn their national team kits, delete any photos or social media posts of them playing football, and to erase any records of what they achieved for their own safety. For these women and girls, the generation of dreamers and hope, those dreams and hopes have rapidly disappeared, and now they are expected to do the same. Popal has gone from raising the visibility of women in Afghan society to telling them to shut and hide themselves away through no fault of her own. Though it was initially very difficult to persuade Afghan women to participate in sport after the Taliban was overthrown, by the time Kabul fell just a few weeks ago and the fundamental Islamist group regained control of Afghanistan, there were 4,000 registered female footballers in the nation's capital city alone. Afghanistan didn't just have a national women's football team, who were only founded in 2007 and didn't play their first international fixture until 2010, but by 2021, they had a national women's youth team as well. Enormous progress had been made in such a short amount of time, and crucially, the Afghan women's team also enjoyed considerable support from Afghan men. The direction of travel was undeniable, but now the dream is over and those who spent countless hours, weeks, months, and years developing women's sports in Afghanistan, either through a love of the sport or due to its wider societal significance, feel as though all of their hard work, all of their efforts, that all of that was for nothing. 
Hayley Carter, the former assistant manager of the Afghanistan women's national football team, has warned that the Taliban is hunting down female footballers and that she believes they will kill them and their families once they find them, as she does her best to pressure various authorities into granting these women a safe passage out of Kabul. A few days ago, a group of 77 of the most high-profile female athletes from Afghanistan, including the women's senior and youth national teams, fled to Australia after the Australian government granted them visas. It is thanks to the tireless work of people like Carter, Popal, FIFPRO, NGOs and human rights lawyers that the international community, and Australia in this case, took that step. But the situation is so far from resolved. The female athletes who managed to escape Afghanistan via Kabul airport had to evade capture at numerous Taliban checkpoints sometimes suffering beatings and dodging gunfire before finally reaching the relatively safe haven of the airport. It is fantastic news that those 77 sportswomen have been granted asylum, but thousands of female athletes remain in Afghanistan. The women's national team has naturally been dismantled before the Taliban even had time to do so by force, and there are no indications that any female sports will be legal under this supposedly more moderate Taliban regime. Two Afghan Paralympians have already been unable to travel to Tokyo for the current Paralympic Games, which they have spent so much of their lives training for, including Zakia Kudadadi, who would have been Afghanistan's first female Paralympian. Men's sports weren't banned by the Taliban during the 1990s, except for boxing, though they did face severe difficulties and received very little state support. The marked improvement in performance among Afghan athletes and Afghan sports teams over the last 20 years has been no accident, as these things so very rarely are. Whilst the threats facing male athletes are likely to be much less lethal than those facing female athletes, unless they had particularly close ties to the former regime, allied forces or opposition to the Taliban, there are still fears that much of the progress that has been made could be rolled back, or indeed worse. The Afghanistan men's national football team were one of the worst ranked national teams on the planet under Taliban rule, before the United States and its allies invaded in 2001, sitting outside of the world's top 200. For context, there are only 210 FIFA-affiliated national teams, and I'm pretty sure there were even fewer at the time. Now they occupy 153rd place, sandwiched between Yemen and Malaysia. They recently beat Indonesia 3-2, a country of 270 million people that is immensely passionate about football, and they have lost just one of their five games, and only very narrowly versus Amman, in 2021. Afghanistan's men's national cricket team was only founded in 2001, having become popularised among Afghans living in refugee camps in Pakistan during the 1990s. Cricket is even more popular than football in Afghanistan, and over the last 20 years, the rise of the sport in the country has been quite phenomenal. They cracked the top 10 of the world rankings for the first time in 2015, the same year in which they made their ICC Cricket World Cup debut. And just last year, Afghanistan leapfrogged Bangladesh to temporarily occupy a record high ninth place in the ICC men's test rankings, as well as climbing to a record high 7th place in the 2020 rankings in 2015. Afghanistan's men's national football and cricket teams are likely to still be supported by the Taliban, or at the very least tolerated, due to the mass popularity that they have developed over the last 20 years, and the fact that the Taliban wants to be loved as well as feared. The big question for the international community, within a sporting context, relates to what sports governing bodies will do in relation to Afghan sports, and more broadly, what can they do? They can either implement sanctions and boycotts, which will punish innocent athletes, or allow Afghanistan's athletes and sports teams to compete freely as they previously did, which could be seen to legitimise the Taliban's regime and to be turning a blind eye to the criminalisation of women's sports, among a whole raft of even greater human rights violations. FIFA has so far said that they are currently monitoring the situation in Afghanistan, but nothing more than that. Whether it is FIFA, the IPCC, or the IOC, these are big questions that come at awkward times for a number of those organisations. The IOC are already facing backlash ahead of the 2022 Winter Olympics, set to be hosted in Beijing, in light of China's human rights abuses relating to their treatment of Uyghur Muslims in the Xinjiang region of the nation. 
FIFA have come under even greater scrutiny for their decision to award the 2022 World Cup hosting rights to Qatar, whose women's national team was only founded when they bid to host the World Cup, more as a token gesture, than through any meaningful commitment to women's football. Qatar didn't have a women's football league until 2012, meaning that they didn't have one when they were awarded the 2022 World Cup in 2010 and their women's team play about as frequently as Jack Wilshire does, presumably they just put on a fixture whenever the FIFA inspector is paying them a visit every couple of years. What these organisations choose to do about Afghanistan under Taliban rule will set a significant precedent. One of the certainties of the Taliban's return to power, both in sport, but of course beyond, will be a large number of refugees, as was the case the last time the Taliban governed Afghanistan. Rabani Nadim, a general in the Afghan National Army, was executed by the Taliban in the year 2000. His surviving family, including his 12-year-old daughter Nadia, subsequently fled Afghanistan, becoming refugees in Denmark. Whilst living in a refugee camp, Nadia began playing football, which she couldn't do in Afghanistan, and she rapidly fell in love with the sport. Nadia Nadim is now one of the Denmark women's team star players, and one of their greatest players of all time. She has scored 38 goals from 98 caps for the national team, in addition to starring for Manchester City, PSG, and in the United States, at club level. Alongside her immensely successful career in football, Nadim has also studied part-time as a reconstructive surgeon, stating her intention to help people once she hangs up her boots. Nadim will become a fully qualified surgeon once she retires from the sport. I know what you're thinking. Bloody refugees coming over here, discovering a love of football, becoming stars of our national teams, and then becoming surgeons who save our lives, or in the case of Nadim, just fix our bodies after suffering serious injuries. It's enough to make you sick. To be clear, I am joking. And more importantly, refugees don't actually have to become international football players or doctors for their lives to be worth saving, and worth making as pleasant as possible in their host nations. As we come to the end of this video, it would also be wrong not to pay respect to Zaki Anwari, the 17-year-old Afghan youth team international who fell to his death last week after clinging tightly onto a US military jet leaving Kabul airport until the aircraft accelerated past 120 miles an hour. His death serves as a reminder of the sheer desperation and hopelessness that millions now face in Afghanistan and the scale of the humanitarian crisis that looms with no end in sight. I am well aware that this has been a thoroughly depressing video in many respects, and I apologise for that fact, and thank you if you've stuck around for this long. But as I said in the introduction, I think it is a topic that is worthy of consideration, that has been largely ignored elsewhere in the media, perhaps for understandable reasons. I would like to end on a note of encouragement or positivity, but they are in short supply in Afghanistan at this moment in time. We can only hope that the millions of Afghans who have grown up with these freedoms, both in sport but obviously beyond, will demand over time to see them reintroduced, and that their reprisals for doing so are as bloodless and painless as possible. Afghanistan is one of the youngest countries in the world, meaning that a huge chunk of the population has no experience of living under Taliban rule. Perhaps that will make them naive as some have suggested, but it is also likely to make them more resistant to the implementation of radically conservative and fundamentalist beliefs that place huge restrictions on their lives, and particularly on the lives of women and girls. Unlike in the 1990s, whilst Afghanistan remains crippled by poverty, the country is online. They should have access to outside information, as hard as the Taliban may attempt to repress it, and in that environment, it is possible that internal opposition to the Taliban will grow. Though it seems a long way off at a desperate situation right now, we can but hope, whilst lobbying our own governments to do what they can to protect Afghan people and other at-risk groups from imminent harm. That is it for today's video, but thank you all very much as ever for watching. Hit the like button if you enjoyed it, let me know your thoughts down below in the comments, and make sure that you are subscribed and have notifications turned on for HITC Sands. You can also find me on Twitter or Instagram via the username at HITC7s should you wish to do so.